Hello and welcome to WEC Talk, the podcast series from the FIA World Endurance Championship. I'm Martin Haven. My guest today is a former racing driver, and what a horrible phrase that is, who's now putting his experience to good use as president of the FIA Drivers Commission. He followed the traditional route for an aspiring young driver, progressing from karting through junior single-seaters before diverting to Japan, where over a six-year period, he became one of the most successful gaijin. A front-runner and title winner in Formula 3, touring cars, F3000 and even sports prototypes. His return to racing in Europe included a one-off drive at the Le Mans 24 Hours, where he performed admirably for a rookie who was relatively unknown in Europe. At that stage, nobody could possibly have foreseen the remarkable string of successes that was to follow, least of all the man himself. Welcome, Tom Christensen. Thank you. That was a, a long, a long entrance. Thank you very much, Martin. I look forward to, to talk to you and talk about the good old proper racing, in uh, particularly in um, in WEC and Le Mans. Well, Tom, where are we going to start? How about with that last statement? When you think back to 1997 and Le Mans, sharing that Yost TWR Porsche, how on earth did that come about? I mean, was that just another drive as you try to piece together a European career again? Uh, there was a couple of drives which came up literally uh, within three or four days before the Le Mans week started. And um, and one was from Rook Porsche and one was from uh, from Joost Racing when Ralf Jutner uh, called me. And uh, the following day I was down at uh, Wald Michelbach, down at the, the team's garage where the, they had Nearly everyone had left for Le Mans with the truck, with the spare parts, with the car. But there was an old monocoque uh, left over and uh, they had used that for testing. And I had a seat fitting in, in that one with, uh, with uh, overseen by Jutner himself and uh, Reinhold Joost. And then um, one lead mechanic, Jörg, uh, Hurt, Jürgen Hurt. And um, that was my, my beginning at Le Mans. And how do you think people perceived you then? You'd had championship success in Europe, but in your junior career in F3, you were much more successful in Japan. But before the internet, and this was before the internet and mm -hmm. YouTube and everything else, none of the gaijin who were racing in Japan were really kind of recognized at all almost in Europe. So were you a bit of an unknown quantity? Um, I, I, I probably was, but I mean, I, I, having said that, I, I won the German F3 championship the year after uh, Michael Schumacher. And, and of course, competing at, at, during these years with all these great drivers, some of the Berner, Punctures, um, there's um, Wendlinger, Frensen, all these guys in the Jörg Müller, all, uh, it was, uh, it was, it was, I wouldn't say I was unknown, but going to Japan, we, we very much had um, a competitive life out there. We very much learned to deal uh, with being um, good friends with the people you fight on track. We, we, we sort of hang out together. We, we were doing sports together and we, we, we traveled together. I mean, I spent more time with Ricard Rydell out there than than I did with my uh, my wife, uh, the, which which was to come much later. We we, we were we were spending a lot of times uh, and and going to fantastic racetracks in Japan. But it is very much before um, uh, live television or live uh, something on the motorsport TV or, or all the, all these things were were not available. It was hard enough to get. Um, Get a, a, a results uh, out into the to the news uh, back in Scandinavia. Well, the first race at Le Mans ended famously in victory, and that's something that Reinhold Joost had, had been quite familiar with. But for you, I'm sure fans imagine, okay, you've won Le Mans 24 hours, and immediately you're an overnight superstar, and the phone starts ringing off the hook. What's the reality? Yeah, no, but it, it it was actually it was tough to uh, to get Le Mans was always a race I wanted to do and I was very close to doing it with Toyota back in the TSO ten, uh, um, but I had to stay and focus on the, on the championship because there was some 
some of the testing in Europe was clashing with the F3 commitments in, in Japan. But the reality was that after I won, um, and, and probably also helped by the, the new lab record, which I had, had done during the late night, early mornings of 1997, was, was something that I had more opportunities now. I had actually offers to go to sports cars with more manufacturers. Uh, so it was sudden, suddenly a, another problem was there. That was I had to choose. So, so the reality was, was, was definitely uh, that the Le Mans victory in 97 was very important for, for my further career. And that was kind of the end of your sporadic European Formula 3000 racing. 98, you were a touring car driver. You did two years in Super Touring Wagen for Honda and then British Touring Cars again for Honda. Yeah. But as you say, the phone rang about Le Mans and you were a BMW factory driver as well in their sports car. So how did that happen? The, yeah, that happened. I, I, I had offers from a few other manufacturers as well, but I thought of uh, that with BMW, there could be a little bit of a... a it, the, the sword could go in, in, in two or three directions uh, as I understood that they might look at Formula One as well. So it was um, an opportunity to go back to Le Mans and, and, and develop a car with BMW and Williams team who was, uh, who was uh, contracted with BMW at that time. And that was in very interesting years. And I learned a lot through these two years where we uh, we won Sebring, 12 hours of Sebring, 99. The 98 was, uh, you can say, it was a, a bit of a disaster as we had to pull the cars out with, with wheel bearing issues very early into the race. Um, uh, a supplier fault uh, had, had not contributed to the, the development which we had done. But in 99, we really showed the, uh, the, the improved car was a, was a success. We won in Sebring with JJ Leto and Jörg Müller with them. Um, with the Snitzer team had taken over the, the entries. And at Le Mans, we were, I mean, when I look back, the largest lead I've had at Le Mans with my teammates was in 99 and in 2007 with, with, with Dindo and Alan. But in 99, it, 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 it hurt the most. That's the, my biggest pain I've ever had was when we retired from nearly a four lap lead in 99, where you can say all the manufacturers were really there. And that car I had, spend a lot of time in in helping and doing my best to to develop it in this direction so um our sister car won after our retirement uh, when the damper broke under jj leto going into porsche corner so that was a that was a hard one to swallow and um that defeat uh, bit me so hard that people have said yeah i've had a run after that when i joined audi with 2000 and until 2005, uh, six victories in a row. But for me personally, um, I could still taste that bitterness of, of, of not having won in 99 uh, th through these years, uh, trying to be motivated, not accept anything before we actually had, had taken the checkered flag. They always say that you learn much more from defeat than you do from victory. And that's that clearly is a, a motivating factor as well. And as you say, 2000, you were with the Audi Sport team. So had BMW told you then that, that their main focus was going to be Formula One and the sports car program was dying? I mean, how did the deal initiate itself with Audi? Um, yeah, now looking back, I, I, I did definitely the right. I mean, my decision to join Audi is uh, my wisest and best decision ever in, 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 a pro in my professional life. So meeting with Dr. Ulrich uh, in the autumn of 99 uh, was a handshake, nothing written down, a handshake, some words has been shown around at the, at the very humble premises at that, at that time. And um, I, I, I really fell at home with, with the people uh, and with the ideas and target they had going forward when he showed me the, the graphics of the Audi R8 LMP1 sports car that we all know from, from back then and how successful it was. But um, BMW was, I was testing with them in, for Formula One in for tires uh, with Michelin. There was a lot of drivers around that time, a lot of young and, and of course, uh, very good drivers. Um, Sanadi, uh, 
Ralph Schumacher, there was Montoya, uh, Jenson Button. At the time, I realized that I probably have to take uh, the right route, and that was uh, to, to join Audi. And that was the, very much the right route. A couple too many sharks in the BMW pool. And you're right, with hindsight, it looks like it was a no-brainer, the best deal ever. But when you'd raced with BMW and Audi made their debut, they struggled, didn't they? They struggled against BMW and they struggled against the Toyotas. So it was, in essence, the feeling you got from Wolfgang Ulrich that made you decide, yeah, OK, these are the guys that I think have got a good chance in it and it feels like a good deal. Yeah, no, no, no. Actually, this is end of 99. We, we had driven in circles around Audi uh, in, in, in Sebring in 99. Mm. And there was people within the BMW camp, some very famous uh, bosses who, uh, who were laughing at me when I said I had also office, or, or, um, I have offers to go to, to the camp a bit more north. Um, but the following year at Sebring, it was actually uh, reversed. The Audi were, had developed and learned from their, um, from, um, their experiences of, of 99. So in 2000, when we made the debut of the Audi R8, it was uh, smooth, it was softened off, the, it was riding the bumps well, the aerodynamic was less aggressive. And I remember having uh, just joined the first testing uh, with Audi at the beginning of 2000 with Alan uh, Magnish and myself had joined the team with, uh, with Bila, Piero, Alboreto, and it was going smoothly. And we, uh, we won a one too. And, and that was uh, a bit easier to walk uh, past the hospitality of BMW uh, towards the end of the... Uh, uh, on the set during the race on Saturday than it was probably at the beginning on, on, on Wednesday. Did you feel that you had a car that could conquer anything? I mean, Sebring is a pretty tough place to baptise a new car, isn't it? And as you say, you know, the bumps are, they always say in America, it's half as long, but twice as hard on the car, certainly. And on the drivers, maybe with the heat and the humidity as Le Mans. Going towards Le Mans with that car, still brand new. And, mm. you know, one win under its belt, all right, a one-two. But did you feel that you had a car that had what it took? Uh, let's say the Achilles heel was it had a lot of uh, turbo lag from 2000. So it was an aggressive twin turbo V8. So it was very, uh, very peaky, but it was had this delay in the, in the throttle. So very... Uh, and it also had some hesitation at, at low throttle. So idling speed was so it, and it would kick in. It was quite difficult to, uh, that was the Achilles heel. And then combined, I would say, with a, an imminent understeer, which uh, was always difficult to keep because it seems to get worse as the front was wearing down. Uh, due to you run like to run it low, but uh, the splitter was was uh, yeah was not as rigid as it, as it was uh, later on. So these were the two things: under steering car, but at the same time a very peaky car. So it was difficult to be fast and consistent. But when we got it in the sweet spot, it was there's no doubt this was uh, this was the car to be in. Uh, but Having said that, to keep it in the sweet spot over 12 or even at, at Sebring or certainly 24 hours at Le Mans was, uh, was very much the challenge for the, for the team and us, us drivers. With Frank Bieler and Emanuele Pirro, you won that year at Le Mans, the R8's debut, and that was the first of three straight wins. When you've got a rich vein of form like going that, how much easier is it for drivers and teams to just keep pushing and pushing, development, training, racing? Do you take more risks? Do you push harder when things are going strongly like that? I think over, over the years, it's, it's quite easy to look back now, but it was not that it was easy at any time. There was always a lot of competition um, and, and certainly just within Audi alone, uh, it was it was a free uh, let's say it was a free uh, dinner table for 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 the drivers. Uh, Dr. Uleg and his people were, were very good at motivating us, and we all had the everything uh, let's say available. Um, he just didn't want to see us uh, let's say having making contact on the track, but uh, 
the rest was, was, was free to, to race. So that means that we were never feeling uh, comfortable or sure or whatever. So we were always um, really um, pushing by motivation and pushing by our own inner strength to, to win with, uh, within the drivers and with, the, with, with the, you can say, the car teams or the group of mechanics and engineers which were, were there. And I think that is, was very much... Um, uh, over the years with, with, with Audi, that's something which I, I felt probably more special than, than anywhere else. I mean, I guess it was also as, at some of our competitions through all the years, but, but nevertheless, I always felt that people from the outside, they, they kind of, um, uh, they, they were a little bit jealous or even sometimes looked up to what we had at Audi at times. And uh, I can understand them. It's just when you, when, when you are within it, we were, we were working hard to be, uh, to be good. We were working hard to be fast, but we had an environment where um, uh, you can say where, where, where people demanded the best from us as well, but in a, but in a, a very natural way. And then it all changed because in 2003, after three straight Audi wins, you were racing for Bentley. So a different car, the Speed mm -hmm. 8, a different team, different teammates with Dindo Capello and Guy Smith. So all of the comfort blanket, if you like, of Yoast, of Audi, of having Frank and Manueli in the car with you had all changed. How different was it? Because, you know, a lot of the perception is oh, the Bentley was basically an Audi with a slightly different body, but that's mm. not strictly the case. No, that's not the case. I mean, I don't know if you will explain yourself, but I mean, the car was very much Peter Ellery and the people at Norfolk developed uh, that car uh, with two years of experience. They then um, got the, um, the budget to, to from what they have learned to build a car for 2003. Um, I was asked, uh, Capella was asked to, to, to join as Audi were, were, were only, will be there for, will be at Le Mans with the private teams. And, um, and, and we, would, we would then join uh, uh, Team Bentley and, and, and Guy. And in the other car with uh, Herbert uh, Blondel and, uh, and David Brabham. And the car was true. It was an Audi engine, a, a three point, um, eight liter engine in where the Audi was a 3.6, but it, it is developed and made by Bereski and his people in, at Audi. But the rest of the car is 100% uh, um, uh, English and, and, and developed. Um, they probably looked a little bit of, of, of the numbers at Audi, but it was definitely um, a true British, uh, British car and British entrance. And uh, it was nice to to be part of that. It's uh, got the narrower Michelin tires uh, than what we are used to with Audi, with the wider as, as it's a closed car. But these were the rules between um, LM, uh, LMP1 and uh, LMGT1. And then things changed again for 2004, back in an Audi R8, which by this stage was getting on a little, at five competitive seasons at least. Team Go, again with Dindo Capello and Seijiara. And as you said, you know, this was the beginning of Audi's customers being able to run cars in the premier class at Le Mans. So a, a whole different feeling and environment again within that team, or did it feel a little more like you were used to? For 2004 with the Japanese team, it kind of made, uh, made the ring that I raced so many years in Japan or five seasons to uh, and then with the Audi uh, and with with a Japanese teammate Seiji and, and of course Dindo who have raced with now for uh, let's say for three seasons including the American Le Mans series it was um, it was very much feeling at home but it was a one-car team and uh, this was a bit the same like my very first entrance with Joost it gives the opportunities of feel like in your garage, everything works for your car, but you have less things to sort of to play with or to get feedback from in testing. So there was both uh, very good advantages, uh, but that was more just the sort of, uh, yeah, probably mental advantages. And certainly uh, you were feeling uh, some of the physicals, you were disadvantages due to the, due to the, the fact that you couldn't test it on two or three cars. 
And you mentioned the American Le Mans series, predominantly from the start of 2000, you'd been racing there as well as competing at the 24 hours. But in 2004, you went from being a prototype racer back to being a touring car driver in the DTM. So you were racing long races, endurance with teammates and a, and a large team, all focused on the car rather than the driver. And then back into really aggressive short sprint races, teammates that are out to stab you in the back and, and to win at all costs and the DTM politics. How much of a of a change of mindset is that from, <laughs> from what had gone before? Yeah, I, I think it's racing in general. It's I have, look, I've been in BTCC as well. So I've been in Japanese touring car. I mean, when, when things are competitive, they are competitive. And so was uh, the case that, uh, also in, in, in DTM. I just always loved this word versatility. And I, I think it really much has been one of my key areas in, in racing. You can say strength or not, but at least it has been a focus point. So it was nice to join DTM uh, as Audi committed there. As a as a fully works uh, works team, and I joined with uh, with with uh, with the team apt, and uh, I can say over I did uh, probably 60, 60 races over um, over the next years, and and I really I didn't enjoy all of them, but I enjoyed by far most of them, and um, uh, the energy uh, of of driving on 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 some very good circuits with, 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 with great drivers, young drivers coming up, F3, young, new F3 champions and Formula One drivers and Le Mans uh, uh, champions coming in at the same time. It was, uh, it was a great, you can say, uh, concept and, and, and great time driving these cars because they are absolutely on the limit. You can say they are more prototypes than, than touring cars, but um, it was fantastic. Over the, over the years driving them. All of those cars every year, there was massive evolution. Whereas returning to Le Mans in 2005 with, with the champion team, old teammates in JJ Leto and new in Marco Werner, but the R8 was still the same car that had won in 2000. And was it feeling now as though everybody was catching up? I mean, the Pescarolos in 2005 were quicker on outright pace your main strength it seemed with the r8 was that the team knew it inside out and if anything failed it was highly unlikely and highly unusual and they would fix it anyway yeah it was it was great uh, after being with the japanese go team i was then with, with, with champion and uh, we were we were two cars but the r8 was castrated as well i mean we we had to carry another 50 kilos of uh, of, of of ballast a uh, narrow rear wing so uh, if people were not catching up, they were certainly faster than us. That included the, I mean, earlier as, as the, the, the years, there was the Cadillacs, there was the Panas. But that year, there's no doubt that Pescarola were there. I think there was three and a half seconds faster than us in qualifying. So we were, we were, we, we were definitely up for a, a beat that year. But the cars, are, um, you, can, you can really hammer them and uh, reliability uh, was very important and then once in a while um, we or um, at, 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 at certain times i was able to put in another lap on the on the fuel before we before we came in for that so in generally we were we were a little bit more effective in the race and we were closer to them one of them had some issues and um, and then in the end of the End of the morning, we were we were leading. There was a slow puncture. I remember very well that I had to rush into the car um, as Marco Werner had a slow puncture, and uh, we were then being challenged. And we would have been normally been uh, been put to into second position about twenty minutes to the end. But then the circuit started to break up. It was a very very hot race, uh, two thousand and five version of Le Mans. And uh, the asphalt after Indianapolis, um, all the way to Tete um, uh, was 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 sometimes were crumpling and and, and breaking up, and um, that uh, that helped us as well. So all these things made it possible. And incredibly, in just nine years, that was Le Mans win number seven. 
So you overhauled Jack Hicks's tally of six, which had taken him 14 years, not going to Le Mans mm. every year, but between the Ford GT and the Group C Porsches. Mm. What about milestones like that? Obviously, when you when you started at Le Mans, you thought I'd love to win Le Mans and then you did and I'd love to win it again. But when does you know, a record like that really start to sink in. Is it when you get home and there's a message from Jackie Ix on your answer phone? Is that what makes you think this is something really, really special? Um, yeah, certainly it may. It's, he actually had called me uh, as he was watching. He was not at Le Mans. He had been at Le Mans earlier the week, but he was watching it. So he, he spoke on my answering machine and watching and, and cheering me on with... Uh, uh, with his girlfriend and a champagne and um, and said something nice words. And of course, when it comes from somebody who uh, absolutely have have lived uh, the, the spirit and legend of Le Mans, uh, but also uh, probably I would imagine being sad that um, a kid like me now uh, stole his record, but then to have that feedback from a man like him, it tells uh, it tells a lot, um, and certainly that was that was very important. But when you look back, it's anyone who goes to Le Mans. I mean, there's there's a fear of of, of making a mistake. There's a there's a thing you have to do well. You want to push yourself to be respected as a driver. You want the team to to give you uh, give you thumbs up and give you good feedback and say they want you back and. It's it's all these emotions, and and when you're out on the track, you have to to push every corner because any time you 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 are reluctant or you would take it a little bit easy, you are not fast enough. So it's all that which at times um, these feelings of any driver uh, at Le Mans when 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 you are doing these laps, when you're doing it good, when you have a good stint, th th this is this is where what gets you to somewhere. And that's what we uh, all all enjoy. Uh, there's no doubt. But yes, when you get the um, the thumbs up um, from somebody you uh, of your um, uh, versatility heroes like uh, like Jackie uh, certainly is. Um, it's 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 very nice. And that 2005 race was the end of the Audi R8. Finally. So Ulrich Boretsky produced a brand new V12 engine for the R10. When did they tell you it wasn't just an ordinary V12, that it was going to be a diesel? What, what was that like the first time you drove that car? Uh, the, uh, the first time, uh, the, uh, Frank Bieler was the first to drive it. And I believe it was the secret test. And uh, I got to drive it was at the presentation in central Paris, driving it uh, from the Eiffel Tower up to uh, Trocadero and presented in, the, um, in, in front of the world press. Already there, uh, you felt this is very different. And uh, for sure, I was uh, chewing uh, uh, espresso, um, espresso macchiato a few times when I heard it first time the year before that uh, Beretsky and the people in Negasulm were working on, on, on a TDI engine. Uh, and we were we were there to make sure this would be sportive, and um, I could feel it sportive. It was an incredibly kick uh, at low revs uh, with the torque of the engine, uh, which would um, which would take me from the Eiffel Tower to Togedero within a second. Uh, so um, a lot of a lot of power, but driving it was was tough over these first um, first months and even first years. Uh, it was a very heavy engine, heavy drivetrain, heavy gearbox, heavy differential, uh, and every, anything in the direction change was was tough with the with the beast. And uh, but when we were accelerating out of the slow corner, hey man, uh, that was <laughs> uh, that was fantastic. Uh, so uh, it was all about for us drivers to point it in the right direction. But that was pretty difficult when you were. When you're coming into the corners trying to to tell the beast w which way to go and it was the start of another 
partnership, wasn't it? You and Dindo and Alan, you started together with the car. You you won at Sebring mm. and the 12 hour race. And yeah. and that continued all the way through from racing in American Le Mans and racing at Sebring and racing at Le Mans. How important are co-drivers in endurance racing? I mean, and in and in your life, I guess. They, they, they are they are very important. And that's what I maybe what I tried to say before that with Audi we 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 really had a, a great camaraderie, but we were competitors. We were we were we were fighters, and we were uh, you know and and data was starting to be uh, more available and more possible. It was we were starting to over the years to work harder with with this so there was nothing that was hidden so all these things was was was, was incredibly uh, let's say i would say we probably matured quite a lot during all these years but we had the greatest respect from each other and there was nowhere to hide from let's say the little older statesman from in the beginning with 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 alboreto um, bila piro of course and then then Alan and 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 Dindu, where I did most of the years with with them in, in let's say towards the mid and and autumn years of, of my career with Audi before youngsters were coming up as uh, uh, Duval, um, uh, Di Grassi, uh, uh, and even Lotterer, um, uh, Fessler, uh, Oli Jarvis, René Rast, uh, uh, Philippe Albuquerque. So. It was a fantastic time with a lot of great guys, and 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 that was really a great time. And then in two thousand and twelve, the World Endurance Championship made its debut. Now, by this stage, you had eight Le Mans wins and a further three podium finishes. Mm. But I know I've spoken to Alan McNeish several times about the importance of being able to even aim to be a world champion. That made a big difference to everybody in endurance racing, didn't it? Yes, it, 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 it's no doubt that we, that we sometimes came on that, that we did different championships and we loved the American Le Mans series, what we did in the early noughties or I personally did. Uh, and then later on, Audi continued there, but then I was with the works program in DTM. But uh, that was fantastic, but it was not a world title. And when we realized that, FIA and um, and and uh, particularly with, with with Sean Todd was pushing uh, to make sure that we would uh, we would be granted back to the good old Group C days and having a World Sport or World Endurance Championship. Uh, it was about being right. There has been enough years where it hasn't been uh, been given, and we realized that actually that it's all these years where we were in in, in with good teams and and good co-drivers. So. For us to have um, a very strong season there, and, and particularly in, in 2013, uh, both winning uh, Le Mans and winning the World Championship, that's something for, um, for us which uh, was very, very satisfying and also um, very important for our careers. Your Le Mans career started with a Porsche Flat 6 Turbo that originated in the Group C era in the 1980s. You raced through the petrol LMP1 era. You raced through the diesel LMP1 era. And then another development with the arrival of the hybrids. How much easier or how much more difficult did they make life for the drivers? Um, it, it's, it's, uh, they, they both had the, uh, or both, all of them had the difficulties. I mean, if you start with the first, there was no, there was no, uh, um, power steering uh, it's a it's a hitch pattern uh, five speed gearbox uh, unsynchronized so incredibly heavy uh, very very heavily uh, paddles and very bad seating position and then you start having pedal shift you on the steering wheel with with the r8 you got uh, you get a little bit of uh, power assist to the steering column but in the end, you you move so much with the with the weight distribution to the rear with the with the TDI gears, they were they were very difficult uh, to drive with in, in direction chains. It had very good traction, but uh, but to get in a point where you could put the traction down was tough. 
and then you go to the hyper hybrid cars with smaller engines uh, where it moved everything into definitely you need to left foot brake all the time to make sure you have the momentum uh, through the corners um, and the top speed were less but accelerating were, were, were good um, it's it's just very difficult to 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 compare in a way it became easier but it became difficult in the end when you had only the certain amount of energy per per lap so you had to be a bit more uh, clinical in in how much energy you used so a bit more busy in terms of that you use the the correct <laughs> Uh, energy at the correct time with the traffic so it was basically always uh, always a moving uh, target always had to make you think but i would say in terms of driving these cars were very much nailed and probably the early years were uh, didn't have near the same uh, aerodynamically efficiency as as the as the car in the end of the, the end of this pyramid has so 2014, your final season of full-time professional racing. Since you've retired, you've been a very successful historic racer, a TV pundit. And most recently, you've become president of the FIA Drivers' Commission. So tell us a little bit about that. What is the Drivers' Commission all about? Yeah, I mean, the... the, the... The purpose has come earlier. Um, Emerson uh, Fittipaldi was initially the, the president of the Drivers Commission, and uh, I joined when I was asked by um, by people from FIA and, and Sean Todd. I had been involved with um, uh, being steward at Formula One races, and in those days, uh, uh, it was very important to try to give something uh, something back to the sport. And, um, and now having been president uh, for several years now of, of a group of people, which include uh, Derek Warwick, Emmanuel Piero, Karen Chantuk, Manuel Reuter, uh, Tatiana Calderon, Mark Duess, Kenneth Hansen, Yannick Dalmal, uh, Nia Morin, uh, Nobuhide Tachi, uh, Felipe Giaffone, Jack Villeneuve, Benito Guerrero, uh, Andrew Howard. And also we have a chair to the uh, GPDA uh, team of, of, of F1. It is very much the main purpose was to give us, or basically all the drivers around the world, um, uh, uh, a voice to the sporting uh, governing body, body's perspective. There are some important key values for the FIA, like circuit safety, integration, grassroots, ethics, um, and within the, all the all the different things in the sport to develop, and the drivers' commission was um, was with no doubt the perfect commission to 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 start with or to implement with. And you're also in, involved in the driver categorization committee now. Obviously, from time to time, driver rankings become a bit of a thorny subject. But that's really critical, isn't it? To try and ensure as level a playing field for all the competitors as is possible. Uh, yes, but th 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 there are so many things which we are, you, you know, we are not, uh, we are not setting everything into concrete. We are advising, but we are basically taking part with all the names I mentioned here. We are taking parts and uh, in, 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 in all the other commission helping. Uh, it could be junior single seater. Uh, it can be a GT. Uh, it can be the circuit commission, it can be the safety commission, and we are all uh, advising, uh, advising there and really giving something back to the sport. What you mentioned, the driver's categorization, is certainly one of the key missions of, of the drivers, of the drivers' commission, and, 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 and it's helping both the drivers and the promoters to establish a reasonable balance in endurance and, and GT categories. It is a very demanding uh, task, uh, Martin. There's a lot of risk, uh, lots of requests and different situations to deal with through, through the season. Um, but the evolution of, of our system has been very positive, particularly the last two or let's say three years uh, since the introduction of this online uh, platform or the development of this online platform that allows drivers to make their request in an easy and quick way and to, to our committee to review uh, each case in, in sort of real time. 
And that's going to be increasingly important, isn't it? Because with it's... Le Mans Hypercar and LMDH bringing real convergence in sports car racing across the globe, this has got to be one of the most exciting times for endurance racing fans, for teams, for manufacturers, for drivers. It, it could be a massive golden era of endurance racing. It will be an, a massive golden era in endurance racing. And I think just to, to finish off before, I think it's very important to mention that there's a lot of drivers who are really, uh, what are you calling, uh, sticking their thong out and looking forward to, with, with, uh, with dripping eyes, looking forward to, to the situation ahead. But the system, which we, with the drivers uh, categorization, there's more than 4,000 drivers uh, categorized worldwide uh, with, of course, by SIO, ACO, uh, Australian GT, IMSA, of course, uh, JAF in Japan, and uh, as they are all covering the most relevant championship and, and, and regions, but more than 4,000 drivers. And I can tell you there's a lot of these, particularly a lot of very young, hungry silver drivers trying to grow up and wants to go into these top line um, uh, cars in hyper and LMDH cars, which is uh, coming available in, in 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 the next in the next few years, and the same with teams. There's a lot of teams who are out there making sure that they will perform and do well, and hopefully make one of uh, and represent one of these uh, great uh, car manufacturers, which has already committed themselves um, to sports car racing. and And we all know that 2023 the 100 years anniversary of, uh, of the great Le Mans 24 hour race is, is very much the bullet point. And I'm sure this has been <laughs> discussed at several board, uh, boardrooms all around the, the world as, um, as a key target. And that shows that Le Mans still remains really relevant, doesn't it? To, to not just to us, to fans and, and competitors, but to the greater world. Yes, it, 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 it does. This race, um, it's sort of, it's where everyone uh, is looking at. It was back then, 1923, probably less, but, uh, but now, 100 years after, it's um, with the heritage, with the history, and of course, with very good uh, key uh, people, and, and, and also in the sense that we have sports car racing, um, People have joined. When you really look at uh, WEC, you look at ACO, you look at FIA, you look at IMSA, and you look at um, at uh, Daytona. And when you when you see what's all been put together, um, it, it's very much uh, down to a lot of people with uh, and working for the good of the sport. Well, I think we're incredibly lucky. If you're an Olympic fan, you only get the games once every four years. We get <laughs> the greatest spectacle in motor racing every single year. And hopefully there'll be a few fans at La Sarthe this year and more in the years to come. Tom, can't wait to catch up with you there. Thank you so much for your time. It's been great to chat. Thank you, Martin. See you there. That's it then for this episode of Wet Talk. My great thanks go to my guest, Mr. Le Mans himself, Tom Christensen. Until the next time, stay safe and thank you for listening.